Thank you very much. Thank you, Therese. As a matter of protocol and a mark of respect, I too would like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past and present. On a night when we come together to discuss the ability of activists and communities to stand together and defend their rights, whether that be to housing or self-determination, it is important for us to keep at the forefront of our minds the ongoing battle of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in this country to be able to fight those battles. And to remember that just down the road in Redfern, at the block, a tent embassy has been established to once again fight for the struggle for Aboriginal housing on those blocks that so many years ago the Green Bands were a part of being able to defend at that time. This whole country is Aboriginal land and when we talk about our rights as community to stand and be part of this country and this land, we should always remember that in our discussions. Tonight I've been invited to speak to you about the life and times of Juanita Nelson and the Green Bands movement. To start with some facts. In the early years, Juanita Nelson was born on 22nd of April 1937 in Newcastle. She was the great-granddaughter of Mark Foy, and for those of you who were born after the 1980s, Mark Foy's was a Sydney department store, which is located, their city store was located in the Downing Centre, what is now the Downing Centre Local Court, which I know that some of our young Greens activists have unfortunately found themselves in recent times. In her early 20s, Juanita completed her intermediate certificate and worked for a time at the Mark Foy's department store. She then left Australia to travel abroad, living for a short time in Denmark and in Morocco. On her return to Sydney at the age of 28, she opened a fashion boutique in Mark Foy's in the city store and it was after this time and some early disputes and negotiations with her family around the money and the funds that were available that she came to be able to purchase a terrace house on Victoria Street and become the head of a local newspaper now, which she published from her home. And it's in this terrace house on Victoria Street and with this local publication now that sit at the heart of why 40 years later we have this meeting where we come together and remember and pay tribute to this woman, Juanita Nilsson. But before I go any further into her story, I'd like to take a slight detour for us to reflect on as women, as people that are participating in this story and this remembering, the fact that actually this speech and the way that this memorial is set up is very much reflective of the kind of values and the shared history that we come together and remember as activists and people that live in Sydney. As I started reading the versions of the Juanita Nelson story of people that have done this introduction in the years gone by, I came to see it that there were personal connections that I found between my life whether it be that our birthdays are both in the same time in April, or the fact that when I first moved to Sydney at the age of 19, I lived on Victoria Street, directly opposite where Juanita Nielsen's house was, that at the time I had no idea that I was living there. And I started to think about the fact that when Lee and others invite us to tell this story, that in effect what they're doing is over a period of history and time, are in effect inviting us to have coffee at a cafe on Victoria Street to hear and meet from Juanita Nelson and to learn from her experiences and take that inspiration into the activities and the work that we do. In many ways, Lee would be much more um, positioned to be able to tell this story than I would of Juanita and the Green Bands. But in inviting women activists each year to share a common history and a common story that lives on in the tradition and the way that Juanita Nelson's life has impacted on so many continues to have a personal impact and effect that we can then share that story and continue it on. So it's with this larger relevance that I tell this story of Juanita Nelson to pull out some of the values that speak to me, not in an attempt to provide any huge historical record of what occurred, there are many more, much more detailed accounts of that, but to give a perspective on that from the here and now in 2014. In the, radical, the book Radical Sydney, the siege of Victoria Street King's Cross is described as this. In April 1973, on a tranquil residential street, a struggle that bridged the new middle class activism and the older radicalism of the working class militancy began. It was a struggle that starkly revealed the violence at the heart of capitalist power. On one side of the conflict were the crooks, 
the standover merchants, the property, develop the property developers, the dodgy politicians and police, and on the other side, the working class residents, middle class squatters, and a militant's trade union. Juanita, through her independent newspaper now, used the publication to be the voice of opposition and criticism and dissent to the planned development that was proposed in Victoria Street where she lived. The planned redevelopment by developer Frank Thiemann under the name of the Victoria Point Proprietary Limited proposed to erect three 45-storey towers and in the process require the eviction of 300 working class tenants from the existing <coughs> dwellings on Victoria Street. Juanita, who was a private property owner on Victoria Street, refused to sell her home to the developers and joined with her neighbour and trade unionist Jack Fowler, known as Mick, in mobilising and supporting the residents against the proposed demolition and eviction. Mick was a member of the Siemens Union of Australia, which later became the Maritime Union of Australia. This community action and opposition to the proposed development was given voice through fearless editorial and coverage of Juanita's newspapers and the coverage that she gave of the issue. Standing hand in hand with that powerful editorial and coverage was another crucial element in the strength of this opposition, opposition towards the proposed development, and that was the Green Bands. Perhaps in what I would describe as one of the most significant and principled and visionary actions that we have seen in the trade union movement in Sydney, the Builders Liberation Foundation with Jack Mundy as the secretary began to impose green bans in Sydney at this time, which are probably best described as the union taking a position that the union had a right to decide how the labour of its members was used and a responsibility to use its industrial power to defend working class interests in the community. In a letter to the Sydney Morning Herald in January 1972, Jack Mundy articulated the union's principles, which I think are very important to remember today. Yes, we want to build. However, we prefer to build urgently required hospitals, schools, other public utilities, high quality flats, units, houses, provided that they are designed with the adequate concern for the environment that rather than to build the ugly, unimaginative, architecturally bankrupt blocks of concrete and glass offices, we will not just become robots directed by developer builders who value the dollar at the expense of the environment. Progressive unions like ours, therefore, have a very useful social role to play in the citizens' interests, and we, we intend to play it. By recognising the broader role that the union could play in the bigger collective project of protecting the community's interests, or perhaps in today's interest, in today's language, defending the 99% over the in, in, in favour of the 1%, the BLF and Green Bands movement had a powerful influence over the Sydney that we know today. And it was in the middle of this strong and visionary trade union action, supporting communities to defend their own interests over the vested interests of corporations and big de property developers, that Winita Nelson found herself. And for me, she found herself in this situation, and I think one of the things that I would like to read from is something that was resonated very strongly with me when I looked back over the other women who over the years have provided the historical recount of Winita Nelson's life. And that was by Debbie Gibson, who's here tonight, I think she was serving me drinks, um, who said in 2012, and I'm quoting, so when I'm using I, I'm use, I, this is what Debbie wrote. She said, whilst reading about Juanita Nilsson writing this introduction tonight, the phrase accidental activist kept popping into my head. I kept seeing Juanita as an accidental activist, a product of circumstances she found herself. But when I thought about this more, I realised that that's what we all are. When asked to write the obligatory, what do you want to do when you grow up, essay, for, your, for my year three teacher, Debbie wrote, she, Debbie spoke, she said, I think it was something along the lines of ballet dancer or maybe teacher, but I don't recall activist high up there. <laughs> and yet I find myself standing here somewhat reluctantly, I admit, being just that and very proud to be in a room full of other accidental activists. For me, when I read Debbie's comments, made in 2012 and read about the life and times of Juanita Nelson and thought and looked at the list of long, long list of names of women who have been involved in these memorial lectures since that time. I thought it was a very common description of what so many personal stories of activism come about. How we find ourselves in a situation where all of a sudden we feel determined to be able to stand up and act and that's the, that to me is the inspiration and the values that Juanita Nelson shares and brings. 
Tragically, as all of you know and as Therese mentioned, in 1975, in what appears to be a clear setup, Juanita Nilsson attended a meeting at the Carousel Club owned by Abe Saffron, who was, Saffron, who was a developer mate of Siemens and was never seen again. A coronial inquest into Juanita's death in 1980 concluded that she had been murdered, but the crime remains unsolved. Over the years, as those who were involved in the incidents at the time have passed on or gained the courage to be able to speak out, additional information has come to light about the circumstances, and that's a another story to tell at a different time. But what is clear is that the ongoing concerns that people would have around the intersections and the intertwined nature of the New South Wales police, the interests of big business, of the New South Wales government, of property developers, and the influence of those on our community are still as relevant today as they were almost 40 years ago. Juanita Nilsson paid the ultimate price for taking a stand, for being willing to stand up to power, violence, and vested interest for her community and for what she believed in. Looking back at this community struggle and of the life and times of Juanita Nelson and the Green Bands, I don't feel it should be a passive reflection if we're going to actually be honouring her activism and her approach. Rather, I have to see it that we need to see this memory as a call to action, to ensure that we continue to step up, to not sit by, to resist, to fight and to take a stand. And at no time has this been more relevant in the current situation in New South Wales. With the revelations from ICAC about our parliamentary system and our government, about the New South Wales attacks, uh, New South Wales police attacks on our students and our peaceful protests and activists, and on the increasing influence of profit motives and big business on asset sales in this state. But I think it would be remiss of me to not mention briefly a struggle that's just happening down the road in the rocks in the light of Juanita Nelson and the discussion that we're having today. It, to me, reflects the exact struggle that was going on 40 years ago that Juanita Nelson gave up her life to be able to defend. And to me, today, in remembering Juanita Nelson, I ask you to use this as a call to action, to continue the struggle, to think of the generations that have gone before us, that have allowed us to be able to build on this radical past of Sydney, to connect in and be a part of continuing a radical future that defends the interests of the community over those that are only interested in profit and selling out the community for their own vested interest. Thank you. Mm.